Welcome everyone to our forum, Ratifying the Escazu Agreement, Women for Human Rights and the Defense of Nature. My name is Osprey Oriole Lake, and I am the Executive Director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, or WECAM. And we're very honored to co-host this forum today with our partner, Reaction Climatica, um, which is based in Bolivia. And throughout our conversation today, we are going to be putting uh, links into the chat section so you can learn more about the different organizations and causes that the women are going to be speaking about. Um, our organization, We Can, is very dedicated to working at the nexus of women's leadership and climate change. And um, so learn more about our programs there. And I'd just like to go ahead and make sure that the speakers are on mute. So I'm hearing a little bit of background noise. If everyone could go on mute to you speak, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Um, during this year's United Nations General Assembly and Climate Week, the impacts of intersecting crises from climate chaos, the COVID-19 pandemic, indigenous rights violations, racism, economic and gender inequality, and so many other ills of our societies continue to escalate in many regions as well as a lot of great work being done on the ground by so many of you who are on the call with us and around the world. But I must say the stakes could not be higher right now and our democracies, our community safety, a thriving natural world and the future literally are hanging in the balance. So I just wanted to take a breath and acknowledge this moment. Um, there's been a lot of losses and challenges for many of us this year. Um, and at the same time, there's also been a lot of learning and lessons that we can bring forward. So I wanted you to know that here at We Can, we are thinking of you and we are holding you close in our hearts, in our every action, and for you to know that you are not alone. During Climate Week, we are taking action, advocating with frontline communities for the protection of our communities and for Mother Earth. And while we push on the agenda of governments to take the ambitious and just actions we so desperately need, we are not waiting. We are fighting and amplifying community-led solutions and movements that are being led by women and femmes, and especially those from frontline, grassroots, indigenous and black women, and women of color from around the world. These are the women who are carrying the solutions that we need. Today, we are focusing, as you know, on the Ascazu Agreement and how we can take action for the ratification and full implementation of this vital piece of legislation that can protect land defenders and natures. In 2018, countries of Latin America and the Caribbean adopted the Ascazu Agreement, which is a historical multilateral accord for the LAC region, guaranteeing access rights on environmental matters, and the protection of human rights and environmental defenders. And although the agreement was adopted, it must now be ratified to come into full effect. And as some of you may know, Latin America is one of the deadliest regions in the world for land defenders and attacks and criminalization of women protecting their territories and communities is very specific as you will hear about in this forum. Yet these are the same women leaders that are central to solutions. So today we are really calling out to defend the defenders. We are also highlighting that many studies have shown us that the most effective way to protect biodiverse regions, such as the Amazon rainforest, which, which as you know, is central in our fight to mitigate the worst impacts of the climate crisis, is in fact to protect the rights and sovereignty of indigenous peoples. So it's imperative to implement policies such as those included in the Escazu Agreement that ensure human and indigenous rights and the protection of environmental defenders. We have a very specific goal today and going forward, which is to engage regional stakeholders in the Escazu Agreement with the backing of the international community, including all of you who have joined us today, with the aim of propelling two more countries to ratify the agreement, which will then allow it into full force. So 11 countries are needed, nine have signed on, and we need two more. So please note that at the end of the forum, um, towards the end, we will be inviting you to take action with us with a petition that we are launching today at this event. So you can be the first signers of the petition. 
um, that will be really pushing um, both uh, Costa Rica and um, Caribbean countries to sign and ratify fully. And with that, I am going to introduce our speakers to you. And in the interest of time, I'm going to give very short introductions for each of, each of these women, but please know we have their full bios on our website. And uh, Catherine Quaid, who's our amazing communications coordinator doing all the work behind the scenes, will be sharing a link to that in our chat section. And um, you know, these women have incredible uh, stories to tell, so really hope that you will look at their bios and look at their organizations and learn more about them. They are all truly amazing women who have been champions and leaders of this fight for the Escazu Agreement. And we're very honored to have each of them presenting today. Um, and first, we're going to be hearing from uh, Andrea Sojueza, who is the representative of the public for the Ascu, Ascu, Escazu excuse me, Agreement negotiations. And she is from Chile. And she's going to speak with us about the agreement and why it is so important and where we stand now in the process of ratification. So with that, I hand the floor over to you, Andrea, and thank you so much for joining us. And just one last thing, because I see new participants have joined us. If you are um, um, an English speaker, when we have Spanish speakers, please click on the bottom uh, of your screen where there's an icon, that's a globe, that will bring you to Spanish translation. And um, with that, Andrea, please take us away. Thank you. You'll need to unmute yourself, Andrea. Okay, yes, now he, thank you so much for this invitation and especially to Carmen that we had been uh, working together all these years for her invitation to this amazing group, which many of you are new faces to me. So that is, that is wonderful. Okay, so she asked me to briefly introduce like the process of the Escazú Agreement and the main content of the, the provisions of the Escazú Agreement. So that's what I'm going to do. And Catherine, if you can help me with the PowerPoint, thank you. Okay, so, well, this, this picture is because Chile, which is the country I, I, I belong to, they, after two years, they decided not to sign, which is very, it's very frustrating because they had been, they have had leadership or during all these years. And yesterday it was a very sad day here because they finally said that they are not going to sign. So this picture is a public, um, I don't know, public activity that we did last year with many people asking to sign Escazú. And in each one of those, uh, um, posters that we hang, they were a name of an environmental defender and what he or she was defending and how hard it is to, to protect the environment in my country. Please, the, the next one. Okay, so this all started, this all is Casu thing, it started in the Rio Plus 20 summit in 2012 where there was a very interesting and strong partnership between a global uh, network, which is called the Access Initiative, that precisely this uh, network was created to work on the implementation of Principle 10. Principle 10 comes from um, the first Rio summit in 92 and says that the best way to handle environmental issues is with the participation of the citizens and for that, we need information and access to justice. So also the country of Chile took a very important leadership uh, in the process to Rio Plus 20, and we decided to work together in a partnership, civil society and government to try to um, convince and to try to have more governments willing to start a process in the region of Latin America and the Caribbean. So the main outcome of this summit, which also it was a big failure for many other topics and issues regarding the agenda of the summit, in this case was pretty successful because we were able to have this declaration on principle 10, it's a formal document, which was signed by 10, 10 countries. So the declaration said first that access rights are very important, two, that the region has moved ahead, but the, the, there is still a lot to do, Third, that countries, distant countries, will, are committed to start a discussion on the possibility of having a regional agreement. 
then that they give that they ask ECLAC for the technical secretariat and that this whole process will be with the significant participation of the public. So this is the first, this was a milestone where this process formally started. Next one, please. So uh, I said this already, that this is a regional agreement on principle 10 and principle 10 uh, highlights or establishes three main human rights which is participation, access to information, and access to justice. The next one. So this process is very, um, many people and organizations and governments recognize that it was very innovative in the way that we civil society and different communities participated during the preparation of the negotiation and during the negotiation. So this significant participation mainly, you, it was concreted in two ways. First, that in 2015, when we started the negotiation uh, phase with a, with a zero document, they were in elections, electronic elections, um, hosted by ECLAC to vote so people can vote and to elect six people that would be representatives of the public. This is the name. So in these six that we are today, we are four women and two, and two men. So women has a very important role uh, in this group. And secondly, was the modalities of participation that were uh, agreed that I guess many of you have experienced in the multi multilateral process or UN summits. So the big innovation was that we were able to ask for the floor during the negotiations and the president has to give them the floor in order of when it was asked. So for example, the government of Argentina can talk and then I can talk and then another people from civil society person and then the government. So that was a huge difference in the quality of the debate and of course, in the outcome of the, of the content of the articles of the agreement. For sure, we, don't get, we, don't, we, we, we didn't get everything that we wanted from the negotiation. We really pushed for more progressive provisions of the most progressive provisions, uh, but we were able to have a collaboration with governments and then with us. We, and we gain, uh, we obtained many and several of our proposals and we have very progressive governments, for example, like the government of Costa Rica that now Patricia is in this uh, webinar and she was the negotiate, negotiator for, uh, for Costa Rica during the negotiation. She was the vice secretary of the environment, uh, ministry of the environment, minister of the environment in Costa Rica. And the next one. Okay, so uh, as it was said, 24 countries there, you can see the countries si signed this, uh, the signatory countries adopted this, uh, this agreement and it was in a locality in San Jose de Costa Rica named Escazú. That's why it's called the Escazú Agreement. The next one. So one of the most innovative provisions that this agreement has, it's first of all, the protection to environmental defenders. You can read there what, uh, it's a whole article on this topic. This topic was proposed and introduced with, by the civil society in partnership with Costa Rica. So Costa Rica was one, one of the leading governments in the uh, pushing for the need and the urgency to have an article regarding how to en enable a safe uh, environment for those who, who protect their environment, their water, their uh, air, etc. And as you know, of course, you know much more than, than me, I would say, uh, many of these environmental defenders are women. So there's a, here's this very strong connection on why this is an important um, agreement for women. Next one. And also another innovative um, issue topic is the special measures regarding persons and groups in vulnerable, in vulnerable situation. And here we can look at young youth or indigenous people or people that is in, a, in, in poverty. So it has the environmental defenders as a special 
uh, focus there and also in persons and vulnerable and persons and groups in vulnerable situations. So if you go through the agreement, the text, you will find several provisions regarding that there should be a special emphasis when it deals with faces with a person or group in vulnerable situation. So there you can see like more specific what those provisions are about, like use language of people that is what's going to be directly affected by any decision regarding the, the environment, offer these indigenous, uh, pardon, these vulnerable groups, technical and financial assistance and consider their characteristics. So that consideration should, um, should channel the way that government has to deliver information and has to put in place this, uh, participation opportunities for this uh, special sector, special stakeholder. Next one, please. So here very briefly are the benefits of the regional agreement. First of all, as I ha highlighted before, that's a progressive and consistent regional standards on information, participation and justice. So if we took a, if we take a look to the to our, our legal framework in all our countries in the region. Of course, not every country is the same and not every country will be in the same position when starting to implement SCASU, but all the countries has to do real and strong improvement, not only on legal reform or new, or new norms, but also in practice on how to implement uh, these access rights and how to facilitate to citizens to be able to to implement them and to exercise them. It has a strong emphasis in technical assistance and capacity buildings, not only for governments but also for civil society. So, and also the um, the secretariat has been very dedicated, ECLAC, to this process, and they are very committed now. Now this year and between 2018 that was adopted pushing for sign signatures and ratification. So we are able to start soon the first conference uh, of the parties. As it was mentioned, we need 11 ratifications. Uh, so of course it can, give, uh, it can give the region also more political stability, thinking that maybe this is like the, uh, the hypothesis, this is like the, the, the vision that if it's better delivered information and participation, probably there will be less environmental conflicts, maybe for sure it will be reduced them, or at least it will channel the conflicts in a different way, because the state should, will have to have an active role in, in them, not as many in our countries today. Uh, and also, um, um, sorry, so, Yes, less conflicts and maybe less uh, access to justice. Of course, access to justice is a human right and we have to have the way to exercise that right. But also sometimes maybe it's not necessary to get to the justice because we're going to be able to influence those decisions that will impact us um, in, with the uh, executive and the public uh, agencies. The next one, please. So it, as it was mentioned there, you can see the nine countries that have already ratified and we need two more to enter into force. And today, if you see number 10, the countries of Argentina, Colombia, Costa Rica, Mexico, and Peru, they are already uh, in the ratification process in their Congresses. So the, they already signed and now they are uh, debating at the Congress the ratification. It's very possible when we are very, very happy that possible uh, early next week, uh, Argentina will be the 10th country because they have already approved it in uh, both chambers uh, uh, at the Congress. And it's, uh, it only, it's only missing at last uh, formal step. So it's very possible that Argentina will be the next country. And for sure, Patricia can tell us about how it's going in Costa Rica. Some, some Congress has been more complicated than others. So they are raising voices against uh, Escazú, uh, unfortunately, especially that has been happening in the case of uh, Peru, very active and maybe Patricia can share us about Costa Rica. The next one, please. 
Okay, so here you can, uh, you can see uh, again what I was highlighting as groundbreaking uh, provisions that has to do with reducing barriers for those vulnerable communities in order that they can better exercise their environmental rights. Next one. And here, it's another very important provision that has to do with facilitating and, and be proactive in the release of environmental information. During the negotiation, there was um, state-of-the-art documents prepared by ECLAC uh, regarding like how was the legal framework in the region, country per country, etc. And we found out there that there's a big a need, an important need in to have more environmental information and to generate more information in, from part of the state and then to uh, release this information. So those provisions are going to be very important for our countries to improve the, the um, amount of information and the kind of information. Next one. Okay, so thank you so much. This has been very, very general, but um, I think it's okay to have like a broad picture of Escazú. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was really, really helpful and uh, really important so people understand um, you know, what we're talking about today. That was a wonderful presentation, thank you. And the next set of speakers will address the struggle of women land defenders and why the Askuzu Agreement is vital to them, um, as has already been mentioned. And I think one of the most important factors in land protection has to do with Indigenous peoples and specifically Indigenous women who are often the backbone of the movements to defend their ancestral homelands. Yet at the same time, Indigenous people have major struggles with mining, logging, all kinds of different extractive industries, agribusiness, um, entering their territories violently and with no consent. And as we know from reports from the organization Global Witness, there's an increase of threats and murders and criminalization of environmental defenders around the world and specifically in Latin America. And women are even more vulnerable as land defenders due to um, things that are unique um, to women as an example, sexual threats and violations when they speak out. Uh, we know that there are man camps associated with extractive industry where indigenous women um, are raped and go missing and murdered with outside workers coming into their communities. And now also where miners and loggers can bring COVID-19 contamination into their communities. So we all really need to stand up and speak out for the defenders of the land who are putting their bodies on the line for all of us, for the land, for water, for forests and the climate. And so we really wanted to give um, the women who are on the front lines the opportunity to speak for themselves today. And we're really honored to have with us first, Patricia Kualinga. She is a Quichua leader from Sariaco, Ecuador. She's a spokeswoman for Amazon Women in the Defense of the Forest, and she's a beloved friend and longtime partner of ours at WeCan. And we hand the floor over to you, Patricia. And also just to remind all of you to go ahead and click on interpretation if you're English speaker so you can hear her with, with the translation. Thank you, Patricia. Muchísimas um, gracias. Thanks a lot, Osprey and sisters who are sharing these events with us and everybody who's listening to us for letting us share our experience from the Amazon. For us, it is very important that Ecuador has ratified the Escazú Agreement. It is very important because this doesn't only have to stay on the ratification, but on the implementation, something that is not seen in our countries. So many times our governments ratify the, uh, the agreements, but they don't implement. And it is absolutely important. In the right to participation, we don't really have an effective participation. They keep going with their previous habits of coming to sell us an idea that is already decided. So we want all the advancements um, 
when they, they do all the advancements to exploit the Amazon, they take the decisions and they just come to us later. Another issue is the persecution to the leaders and to the defenders that are fighting to defend ecosystems like the Amazon. We have been criminalized, we have been persecuted. Many times threatened and sometimes murdered. This has to stop because our country and the world needs to have conscious that our fight is not an isolated fight of the environmental defenders or the indigenous peoples. It is a fight that allows the world to survive, not only Patiwalinga, not only Pastaza, not only Ecuador, but our fight is for an equilibrium, for the planetary balance, for people to have, to enjoy a balanced life and a healthy life. The fight of people's, indigenous peoples to have a healthy environment is something that needs to be visibilized. It needs to make be visible to find this equilibrium that we're looking for. When we talk about rights, we need to talk about rights of indigenous peoples. We need to talk about the people that eat in the territories, the people that is fighting so the rivers are not polluted. And the government doesn't have to keep without the speech that the government is the one that decides because, and they have uh, the right to keep exploiting and polluting and making concessions in our lands. It is not like that. This right cannot be on top of the rights of the human beings, being indigenous peoples on being universal human rights. And for that, I am calling to the reflection. So we can look at the laws. That rights cannot be said we need economy to push the country up. We need an economy that is common for the benefit of all. It, they cannot say it doesn't matter if we murder indigenous peoples and environmental defenders. And this is something that is happening in our countries. Even countries that have ratified the Escazú Agreement, they have to go beyond this ratification and start implementing. We cannot keep with a system that violates human rights. We are in a crisis that is an environmental crisis and a health crisis. I am with, I have many years fighting for these causes. We have denounced to the government of Ecuador and to the American Court of Supreme, Supreme Law. So they can come and ask us before and take our free prior and informed consent. And this is a word that governments don't like. They are allergic to this terminology. They need to take us into account because the consultation needs to take account into account indigenous peoples. And if they don't have our free, prior and informed consent, it cannot go on. We are fighting. So this becomes a reality. We and indigenous people, we can go and say, no, we don't want this. This is not okay. We are original and indigenous peoples that are fighting for our rivers to not be polluted. And thanks to the fight of these indigenous peoples and thanks to our indigenous knowledge, we still have this portion of territory. We still have forests. We could talk about everything what we have gone through as Amazon women and as the peoples from Sarayaku. So there is an international agreement and a, a legislation system that can stop the violation to the rights of indigenous peoples. It's a hard fight, and sometimes we spend our whole lives in this. 
Sometimes we don't even dedicate time to our families because we're dedicated to this fight. While we could dedicate more of our time to build a better world. In this COVID context, we invite you to this kind of reflection and to think about real changes. Sadly, access to justice is another thing that doesn't have attention from the governments. They want to use the legal systems. And when we make denounces, the justice doesn't progress. There are obstacles for the uh, research of the murders of indigenous peoples and indigenous women. And nothing had a good result. We have asked for the justice to find the responsibles of these murders and there is there are no results. We don't find the responsibles. We think there is the dark hand of somebody that doesn't want this information to be spread because it would make damage to the oil companies and they don't want that the people who defend the environment are protected. We are still here, we are alive, and we will still be fighting with all the natural elements that we have and with the laws, reminding the governments that they signed these agreements, like the Escazú Agreement, international law, the World um, Work Organization, and their decree 169, and all these other conventions that protect indigenous rights. I thank you a lot for your listening, and we will keep on this fight until our very last breath. Thanks a lot. Patricia, for taking time with us today. Um, I know that you're calling in from um, where you, your homelands um, in Sariaco, um, in the jungle. And thank you for bringing the spirit of your wisdom and your people and your land and the incredible fight and strength that the people of Sariaco have. We deeply, deeply appreciate it. And you know, just again, to highlight how much um, indigenous women, indigenous people are literally putting their bodies on their line for years, protecting water, the Amazon rainforest, um, the land, the climate, and how we really need to stand with them today and always um, in their incredible work for forest protection. Thank you so much. Um, and now we're going to be moving from um, uh, uh, being in Ecuador to Bolivia, and we have um, several presentations from Bolivia. Uh, first, we're going to be seeing a short trailer from a film called Uma, A Water Crisis in Bolivia. And then we'll be hearing from Ana Lacer, who is the filmmaker. She's also a journalist and environmental activist um, from Spain and the USA. And then directly after her, we will be hearing from Maria Luisa Rafael, she is a Quechua leader uh, and a human rights and environmental activist um, from Bolivia. So first we're gonna be seeing the short film about Bolivia, hearing a little bit from Ana, and then moving to Maria Luisa Rafael. And again, um, I just wanted to say, cause I still see people questioning, uh, the way that you um, are able to hear when the Spanish speakers are speaking is you go to the bottom of your screen and there's a little uh, icon that looks like a globe you click on that, but then beyond clicking on that, you also have to select English, and that will take you to the simultaneous interpretation. Okay, thank you so much. Let's go ahead and show the video and then go directly to Ana Lacer. Thank you. El agua es vida. Donde no hay agua, no hay vida. Nosotros aquí vivimos de los pozos, sacamos de los pozos el agua, pero el agua ya no es bebible, ni siquiera los animales pueden beber. 
todas las aguas en las minas que van bajando ríos abajo, son las que alimentan el lago Popó. Todas esas situaciones las hemos ido demandando, denunciando en su momento, no hemos ido escuchados hasta que se ha secado el lago Popó. Después de 50, 40 años de contaminación, necesitamos deshacimiento. Tienen que las empresas, los cooperativistas, reacondicionar la conducción de las aguas de mina, que no vayan directamente al río, todo amarillo, todo contaminado. En esta comunidad nos encontramos sin trabajo. Nos ha abandonado nuestra madre tierra, nuestro Pachamama, nuestra Cota Maecota. Es como si la minera fuera una metralladora y nos aniquilara a todos los comunales. Es un sector productivo que no solamente mejora su situación económica, sino también mejora la economía nacional. ¡Que vivan las mineras y pañeras de Bolivia! ¡Que viva el Comín! ¡Que viva nuestro proceso de cambio! Muchas gracias. Acá, hermano, el Irimane en extensión. Más de 10 empresas chinas dominan las explotaciones en Bolivia. Los químicos, explosiones están matando la montaña. Nuevamente está queriendo ocurrir el saqueo de nuestros recursos naturales como en los tiempos coloniales. Y han capturado aguas subterráneas más va a ir secando. Ya es basta. Que hemos hecho nuestras denuncias, nuestras demandas a las Naciones Unidas, a dónde más podemos ir. Lo que importa es que la tierra se ha secado, el lago se ha muerto, se han muerto los peces. ¿Y, y quién defiende todo esto? Thank you so much. And now we'll go to Ana. Let's hear, please go ahead. You're on mute. Hi. There you go. Hi, hello. Thank you so much for attending this forum. So the, docu the documentary is called Uma, which uh, is the word for water in, Anim in Aymara language. Uma chronicles the struggle of three indigenous communities in the Bolivian highlights uh, over their right to the local water sources during a water crisis that happened in 2017. So a severe, a, a severe drought affected thousands of people across the country and a state of emergency was enforced for 100 days. And Bolivia has also lost at least 40% of its glaciers in just two decades because of global warming. So I just started to investigate this water, this water dispute when Lake Popo, the second largest lake in the country after Lake Kikaka, dried out in 2015. And I found out that this region of the Andes is full of mining operations, which use huge amounts of water for its production and also contaminate the rivers. Um, uh, for decades, these communities have suffered uh, the impact of these mining activities on their health and the environment, forcing many communities to migrate, for, uh, to, migrate to the cities. Uh, the documentary explores the, resist the resistance of indigenous communities against large-scale mining and the barriers they face um, in seeking access to information, public participation, and justice in environmental matters. So each community uh, showcases one of the mentioned, mentioned barriers in this documentary. So we follow Maria Luisa Rafael, who is our next speaker. She's fighting for environmental justice and redress after decades of mining contamination. Her community is located near, near Lake Popo, which has been damaged by mining activities, the diversion of rivers, and the global warming. Uh, more than 100 mining companies have been discharging their waste directly into the rivers that feed Lake Popo. So the communities around the lake have been forced to migrate because they cannot grow food anymore. For that reason, Maria Luisa, uh, who, is, uh, who is gonna talk now, she's been relentless in her for sweets to save war, to save, save war, the water in her community and to ensure that mining companies comply with environmental laws around Lake Popo. Despite of being threatened and beaten for, from uh, even her own family, she's gonna tell her story now. She has continued uh, speaking out against water pollution and co 
corporate environmental destruction. So Maria Luisa is going to tell more now about her story and why she decided to participate in this documentary. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate the, the film and the introduction. Maria, Luisa, Rafael, please, um, if you would speak to us. I think you're on mute, so you'll have to take yourself off mute. Thank you, Maria. Bueno, muy buenas tardes. Agradecer por este evento porque es muy importante para nosotros. Very important for us. Those of us who struggle for the environment and our leaders. To be a leader defending Mother Earth is very difficult as a woman, and especially when our rights are being violated. In 2016, I was named in my community as an environmental defender because we have three mining concessions in the IU, the community. And so they named five people, of which I was one and still am. That's where my fight began. That's where the struggle began for life in the Mother Earth. I didn't know what it was about at the beginning. But upon taking on this responsibility, the first thing I did was to seek where we could demand and ask that our community be re respected by the mining companies, both in terms of harm to the environment and the right to life, in defense as well of our human rights, because we were attacked by the miners, especially the concessioners. concessioners. Not all of the workers were from our area. They bring them in from other places. And so they don't care about the norms that we have in our communities. For me, it has been very difficult because they have attacked first my family, my husband, and friends. So my struggle has extended even to my brothers and sisters. They have even tried to fail to recognize me as their sister because I was causing a fight in the community. And what they don't understand is that in this struggle, we must, we must have a legal process against those who are contaminating. In Bolivia, our president always defended the Mother Earth. Well, they didn't listen to our demands. They have even degraded our people, and they have persecuted us through the justice system. Many times I have been tried, but so far we're still alive because the Mother Earth needs this struggle. And after this, we also turn to organizations that defend Mother Earth. Well, we really haven't been supported frankly. And that's why as a community, as communities, we need for there to be justice because we have to leave our communities to find ways to live in the cities. But we don't end up living the way we should. We don't have our own homes. We don't have a source of employment. And so we're like beggars. That's something very difficult for us as community members to have to leave our communities and not have any laws that protect us, particularly we women who have all the responsibility for our children. We have to figure out how to feed them. If we lose water in our communities, we lose everything. The groundwater is also contaminated. We can't shout and say the things we need in our communities because they silence us. And they even tell us that we've invented this. 
and as leaders, people who are named in our communities. We have interests. It's hard for us to get justice in the environmental matters. The waters that go directly into Popo Lake have been contaminated. And the reason is those mining companies in the surrounding area. There's no environmental monitoring from the Ministry of the Environment, much less the Ministry of Mining. We are completely without protection. Lots of people have been persecuted and even killed in this struggle, especially old people. I'm becoming one of those old people. I've been in this fight for more than 15 years and we still don't have justice. Moreover, the leaders, men and women, we spend our own money taking the bread out of the mouths of our own children to fund this struggle, to write a note or to travel from La Paz to Oruro. It costs money and nobody reimburses us. Even our own families criticize us for this struggle. They say, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do? It doesn't just take one day. We have to go step by step to bring our struggle to the central government. But we don't get a response and our waters are dying. The rivers in the municipality of Popo are completely contaminated. If you've been able to see what our lake is like, it's not just mining. It's also the wastewater from the city that goes into the Popo Lake. And so we continue in this struggle and I don't think we should have to die continuing in this struggle and not see any justice. It's a shame that even though the water law has been approved, because we could have defended all of our water sources with that law, but instead they approved a mining law. It completely violates our rights in the communities. We can't do anything. They say that it's economic development for Bolivia. And they forget the renewable protection, the renewable production that's being killed in our country. We can't eat metal or mining or silver or gold. We're killing our life. The worry that I have as an environmentalist is how long are we to be in this struggle? All of Latin America is defenseless and there's no justice. In Latin America, it would seem that nobody says anything. We must all raise our voices to raise awareness among people, to raise awareness among everybody so that our Mother Earth and our nature doesn't die. And I thank Ana Yasser for having come to Bolivia and come to my house and my community to spread the word about the reality that we're facing, what we're really living through. We don't have production. Our rivers are dry. We've got nothing for ourselves. Last year, there was a drought. We weren't able to sow our potatoes. And that's our major concern. As a woman, as a leader, I feel worried. And I don't want to stop struggling, but I'm tired. I need help to continue struggling in this life. What can I do for my children and my grandchildren? That's my major concern. Not just mine, but those of all the community members who are old and we're tired. We don't have sources of water, which is the most important thing. Our demand has gotten to the, our complaint has gone to the international level. My concern 
my worry is great. I want you to help us and unite. Thank you uh, so much, Maria, for your powerful presentation and words. And, you know, my heart is breaking listening to you. And I just want to say how much that I, and I think we all deeply respect how hard you have worked your life long and that you should not be alone and you deserve to have support from outside your community. And we really hope today's forum can be one piece of many, many, many pieces of a puzzle that will lead towards there being justice for you and a time for you to not have to fight so hard. So that's why we're working hard today in this forum and all of these women have been fighting for so many years. So I just really wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing your story with us and, and for your struggle and know that we stand in solidarity with you and we see you, so thank you. Um, we are now going to um, move from um, our conversation um, in Bolivia um, to Brazil. Um, and we're gonna start this section on Brazil with a short film called Stand with Indigenous Peoples of Brazil, the Amazon and the Climate. So we can get a flavor of what is happening in Brazil. And then we'll be hearing from uh, Tali Torena from the Torena Nation of Indigenous Rights. She's an Indigenous Rights activist from Brazil. And um, I think one of our speakers, um, Paloma Costa from Brazil, may need to be delayed a little bit. So we'll, we'll um, bring her back into the program when she's available. But for now, let's go ahead, Catherine, and show the film, and then we'll hear from Tali Torena. Thank you. É pirairá, neraí, é a tupã. É pirairá, nerazê, é a tupã. A conjuntura política brasileira é muito grave para toda a população, em especial para nós mulheres. E agora temos um presidente que, que acha que as mulheres têm que ser, têm papel secundário, salários menores. É, está aqui participando do Fórum Permanente da ONU, em frente à Embaixada do Brasil, para nós tem um significado muito forte. É porque é reafirmar a presença e a existência indígena em todos os espaços. Brazil is the deadliest country in the world for environmental defenders. Since the election of Bolsonaro, there has been an increase in the killings of indigenous peoples in Brazil. These are their lands, their forests that they have maintained. So it is up to all of us to be protecting indigenous rights. It's the morally correct thing to do to help our indigenous sisters and brothers when they're under attack, but also for all of us because of the climate nesse momento o órgão institucional políticas públicas pouco importa Porque o que está nesse momento em pauta é exatamente a destruição, o extermínio e, mais uma vez, o genocídio coletivo de nossos povos. Eu não sei o resultado da nossa mobilização. Pode ser que na próxima semana vocês tenham notícias de várias lideranças nossas presas, criminalizadas ou mortas. Porque esse é o momento que a gente está. Mas nós vamos seguir firmes, resistindo, pagando com a própria vida. Porque para nós, a luta pela Mãe Terra é a mãe de todas as lutas. É que são nossos territórios sagrados que garante o ar, a água, né, o clima e que garante a vida no planeta. Nós precisamos urgentemente romper com esse modelo 
de desenvolvimento que usa de forma predatória a Mãe Terra. Estamos aqui para reafirmar que a luta pela Mãe Terra é a mãe de todas as lutas. Nova York pode até ser o centro do mundo, mas o que garante a vida no planeta é a Amazônia. Thank you so much. And just, just for reference, uh, the film was obviously made before COVID pandemic. Um, just to, to recognize that we are all um, really practicing social distancing, but from our, you know, wanted to share the voice of Sonia Guajajara, as some of you know, a very powerful indigenous woman leader in Brazil. And now I'm very excited to invite uh, Tali Terena from the Terena Nation um, in Brazil. She's an indigenous rights activist and we welcome you. Please take the floor, thank you. Thank you, Osprey, and thank you, Carmen and Catherine, for the invitation. Uh, I'm really glad and honored to be here with you, uh, sharing a little bit of our experience here in Brazil. I got a little emotion with the video. Uh, it, uh, it was from last year, if I'm not wrong. And from there, when the new film was made, uh, and violence happened in our country. And I was like seeing the movie and got impressed on how much uh, violation of our rights uh, has been done in only one year of the government of Bolsonaro. And um, so uh, I want to bring a little bit about the perspective of the Escazú Agreement. Um, me uh, being an indigenous woman uh, and in a youth, I was in Hill Plus 20 um, when we had this, um, when it came out, the, the, the idea of doing this agreement. Uh, and I, I remember when I listened for the first time that I was like thinking, how come uh, uh, like human rights and environmental rights are things that it's separated, it's not only one thing. Because for us in our um, Cosmovision, it's only one thing, like you can't separate it, uh, your life from the, from the environment. So how come you can uh, talk about the rights in a separate way? And then I noticed that um, we have a bigger problem, uh, like the root of this problem, and that normally were not mentioned, not even in the, the agreement or in the negotiations about climate change. That is the, the colonial, um, the colonial way that we are living, the colonial system that we are living that uh, uh, dropped us until this moment that we are facing not only the pandemic situation, but uh, many natural disasters all around the world. Um, I also want to bring the importance of this agreement, uh, not only for Latin America, and I'm so glad that I can see many uh, different persons from different parts of the world uh, uh, interested to know what is this agreement, uh, what we are doing, and interested to hear our stories. And I hope uh, that we could do this pressure in this in this governments that um, like Argentina, like uh, Costa Rica, that are one of the countries that can uh, ratify, that have this perspective of ratifying the agreement until the uh, the the limit, uh, the day limit, and um, and as Osprey uh, mentioned, I hope you all that are watching us can uh, sign the petition and help us to put pressure on those governments, because for us, this is a really important tool to fight for our rights. Uh, I know that we are we are already have a lot of documents, uh, a lot of uh, agreements, a, a lot of treats, and that normally it's. Uh, it's difficult to see how they, they are being implemented. And it's difficult to see how we are gonna use them, uh, not only the paper, but uh, in actually in our daily lives. So I hope you guys can help us in doing this pressure in our governments. So, and 
saying that about the general view of Escazú, I want to bring a little perspective of Brazil. And so, as I started saying, like we have deep, deep, uh, biggest violations since last year. And I think you all could see this year, um, we have again the big fires in Brazil, destroying um, not only the Amazon, but we have other um, biomes, like other environments that are being threatened as well, like Pantanal. And I know that normally people are not uh, aware of this environment, but this is the, the environment that where I come from. And I also know as Chaco, because we have in Bolivia and Argentina as well. And uh, this, this violation, um, it seems that we are walking uh, back, you know, like all the, the efforts that we made, all the efforts that our elders made, that uh, made us uh, reach to this point. Uh, I see a lot of women's and it's, for me, it's really inspired to see the women's um, leading this process, not only in our communities, but also in a political perspective. So Escazú, it's uh, a great opportunity for us to like hold the time that we are living, like to not uh, make any step back but moving forward. I know this is like a global issue that we are facing like fascist governments, that we are facing a lot of races, but we have uh, hope. Uh, and I think Escazú, it's is this light of hope for our, for these negotiations. And, uh, <laughs> sorry, and, uh, and not only the, I'm sorry, I'm a bit nervous to speak in English, but I think um, what we see here in Brazil with this uh, violation of our rights uh, and of our land and now with the COVID pandemic and the fires, it's as our sister said, it's we need we need attention, we need uh, help, and this in, uh, movement that we are doing, like this network that women's are leading, that women's are doing, because we need to say that the men's and not and being indigenous and being non-indigenous, the men at in a general way they led us in this, this situation. But the women's are transforming, the women's are occupying in spaces. And Escazú will guarantee, would be a, a tool for us to uh, put pressure in our governments that we are uh, participating in the decision-making. Uh, in the beginning, the, 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 the girls brought some um, data, like for example, the 80% of the biodiversity of the world is being maintained by indigenous peoples. But um, when we go to the negotiations process, uh, we are not present, like our voice is not there. So we need to guarantee also that we are present in this spaces, but not only small groups, but um, that we can have, and not only men's, but we can have women's and youth also in this moment. Um, we, uh, we said that, uh, we said that uh, we need to get involved more people to this fight, but we don't know, we don't say how. Like Escazú, for example, if you go here in Brazil and I imagine in a lot of countries in Latin America, uh, and you say about Escazú agreement, few people will know because there is this technical language, there is this technical uh, negotiations that have been, been going on that the civil society is not being aware of. So I think not only put pressure uh, and being ratifying, but also how we're gonna implement in our countries, uh, how we're gonna involve other groups of um, civil society that uh, are not aware about the environmental crisis, uh, how we could uh, put those people more involved in this process. Because as Patty said, uh, if this is not the fight for indigenous peoples, this is not the fight for the minorities is the fight for everyone. And I think Escazú, uh, not only it's a, a great tool for that, but can be a really inspire, uh, inspire movement for other countries. I saw some comments from uh, 
people from Asia, from Bangladesh, from Philippines that also suffer a lot of types of violation. So I think um, Latin America, yes, we have a lot of cases. We have the, the Amazon region, we have this biodiversity preserve, but it's not only us that are suffering in the world. It's not only the indigenous people from Latin America that is suffering. Uh, uh, we need to see the connection, and I think the pandemic uh, brought us uh, this this evidence. You know, people that used to think like, "Oh, how come I can be connected with Europe? Or how come I can be connected with Asia?" And now, with the the one virus that we cannot see, made us us together in in really a uh, fast time. So the same way that the virus did that, we need to uh, recognize and we need to. Uh, be conscious that the air that we breathe, it's, it's connecting all of us. So um, also want to bring a little a bit of the perspective of the youth. Um, so in, the, in 2018, we have a group of youth there, indigenous youth, that we were trying to put a pressure um, also in the governance, but in, in following the negotiations. But in, also in our countries and our communities, we are bringing our voices. We are trying to be more involved in this process, not only in the political way, but also in the actions. And, and when I think about the ratification of how we can communicate more about this agreement, I always um, uh, think about the youth and not like, not 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 only myself or people from my age, but like kids, like babies, and that the, the ones that are being born right now. That we how come we can pass this conscious for the ones that are still coming, or for the ones that are like being locked down right now in their homes and not understanding what is happening, because like uh, the elders already made so many mistakes that brought us here, and. And the youth, uh, we, are, we are excited, we want to be part of it, but we need opportunities. And I know many of you uh, work in different areas and with different, with different stuff. We have a purpose that brought us together here. So um, I always like to provoke and how come we can uh, bring more people, more youth and more indigenous to the, to the changing that we are planning. And to finalize, maybe, um, because we have short time, but uh, uh, I want to also say about two uh, items that I like in the Ascazu Agreement. That is the thing about the uh, general generation equality. Uh, so again, about what I said here about the youth being uh, working with the elders. We have these in our communities, but I think we, we should uh, go go on like not only in the communities but also in the political process that are uh, uh, deciding about our future and also about the the thing uh, that they say and i'm sorry that i don't know how to say this expression in english but to hold the process so you're not gonna go back it's from here to 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 the front and this is really important because this guarantee for us that we're not gonna fight all all back you know like here right now in brazil uh i saw like since hill plus 20 we have a lot of political um, programs that help us to protect the environment to have to give opportunity to indigenous peoples like for for example i went to the university and other relatives also went to the university and have access to information that have access to opportunities to grow and in only one year, uh, the government that was elected to be president, because I don't like to say his name, uh, I think he, does, he doesn't deserve this attention, but he made a lot of uh, changes in only one year. You know, like last year was Amazon. This year is Pantanal. Next year will be Cejado, that is the, the, the cradle of waters of Amazon. And again, everything is connected and it may not uh, look uh, big importance, um, like a small environment uh, being fire since we have like 
bigger issues or as he said we have to focus on the development of the countries and I think uh, Escazú it's uh, also a great opportunity to that because it, 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 it looks for a balance between development and the guarantee of our rights and again the importance is not only about the human rights but the, the rights of all the, the living beings in the world and we need to work on that and looking forward to see how we're going to implement because hopefully with uh, the pressure that we are doing as civil society from different uh, groups, from different nations, from different perspectives, uh, we can um, ratify this agreement and implement with more uh, intensity and to have more um, activities from the women's. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tali, for your really powerful presentation and bringing the youth voice, uh, which we definitely want to support, um, especially young women leaders like yourself. It's so important to hear from you and have that perspective of intergenerational activism and solidarity. And um, also just to really highlight that one of the reasons we're having this forum today is to bring awareness to the Escazú Agreement and understand that this is a global issue. What happens um, in the Latin American Caribbean matters to the whole world. And none of us can be thinking that we're separate from one another. Um, you know, just taking the Amazon rainforest as an example, you know, our, um, all here in the global north, our, our very ecosystems and the oxygen that we breathe and the well-being of our weather are all connected to what is happening in the global south. So we need to get out of these contexts of thinking we're separated and realize that we're all together. We need to have international agreements and international laws and justice and accountability for these laws that really help us lift up human rights and the rights of nature and the protection and defense of nature that we're all connected to and make sure that the people who are doing that work are protected as they work so hard to achieve these goals. So thank you so much. And with that, I want to um, bring Carmen Caprilis into the conversation. She is a wonderful friend and ally. Um, she is the founder of Reaccion Climatica. Uh, we're very honored to have her as our weekend coordinator for Latin America. Uh, she's based in Bolivia. And also just to say, we are very thankful for her co-hosting this event today. Carmen, please, if you would take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Osprey. And thank you everybody that is right now listening to us. We wanted to do this, uh, this webinar in English because there has been a lot of conversation already in Spanish in Latin America about the Escaso Agreement. But now we would like to, to to speak to our allies, to, to know uh, what this CASU agreement is. And I think uh, Andrea did a wonderful job uh, explaining that. I also want to acknowledge that Andrea has put a lot of effort during almost two decades into the agreement. So uh, I wanna thank, thank, for, thank her publicly for that effort that has been uh, a, uh, a lot of pressure in order to have this agreement and there were times that uh, it wasn't really clear how it was going to be. And I think the importance of this agreement is that it acknowledges the vulnerable populations and <clears throat> the environmental and human rights defenders. And when we speak about Latin America, it's really hard because uh, Anna once told me it has lots of layers. In the videos you see presidents and it's really hard to see who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, what's going on, because there's a lot of interest going on and there's a lot of struggles that are almost never shared with the rest of the world. And one of the greatest things that we have in Latin America is that we are bio biodiverse, not only because we have uh, ecosystems and species, but also because we have indigenous populations that are still, uh, that still have that connection with earth that uh, many of us in the occidental world and in the cities were losing. Uh, 
we we have forgotten where our food comes from. And I think that's the basic instinct that we have as humans. And right now we, the, for example, the Amazonian forest is burning and it's mostly because there is a high demand on meat, the high demand on soybean, a high demand on palm oil. And those are ingredients that we find in most of our food. So in order to start changing this system, we must acknowledge what is our food system based on and how this food system is impacting on local communities. And it's not only food. You also find that in minery, many of the things that, um, of the minerals that you find in your computers or your cell phones are also a product of this system that uh, is uh, going to the communities, contaminating their waters and uh, pulling out the resources. And I think this pandemic has shown us how linked we are among us. And uh, I think it's a result of an environmental crisis. And uh, we still have not learned that uh, the solution to this pandemic is not going to be only the vaccine. The solution to this pandemic is that we really change our relationship with nature. And in that sense, I'm really thankful for all the women that are right now here uh, sharing their experience, their struggles, and uh, showing us how complex their realities are and that we still need this commitment to, to Earth. So thank you very much. Thank you, Osprey, for hosting this event. And thank you to all the wonderful women that are here. And we really hope that uh, the uh, agreement eventually gets into force, uh, enters into force, and the, that we find our governments finally accountable for what's happening, especially for the crimes against human rights and environmental defenders. We live in the deadliest re uh, uh, region of all. We have almost 200 cases of environmental killings only in 2019. And we have to change that trend. Therefore, I, I, uh, my commitment is toward the ratification of this CASO agreement in order to see these struggles uh, come to an end and that we really acknowledge that planet Earth is more important than just resources. It has to be a way of life. Thank you. Thank you so much for your powerful comments. And it's just such an honor to be with you and to have you on our team and to be uh, leading this really incredible effort for the ESCO agreement. And, um, you know, just wanted to also echo how important it is that um, we're talking about systemic change in the world right now with the pandemic. Um, you know, many of you might know that one of the primary reasons that the COVID-19 pandemic was started is because of humans going too far into nature, taking up too much habitat of the natural world. And that's where these crossovers of um, viruses that should be left in the wild and wild animals happen with humans when we've taken over too much habitat. So it's really Mother Earth loudly speaking to all of us that we have to change how we're living. And I think one of the most important ways we can do that is to lift up the voices and ways of life of indigenous people who are living in balance with Mother Earth and teaching us how to live in a good relationship and with responsibility and care for nature. So um, just to really highlight that this is a really key agreement that can help us move forward in that direction. And now we have two more speakers um, that are going to be addressing the advances and the state of ratification of the Ascazu Agreement in the Caribbean and in um, the Republic of Costa Rica, where the Ascazu Agreement was formed, as you heard. And um, we're really glad to hear about the move on Argentina. So we really want to put support in for that, but we'll still need yet one more ratification. And so we're really focusing um, our campaign today and the petition, which you can see is in the chat section. We hope while we're talking, all of you are signing that petition. And I'm gonna be handing the floor over to two really amazing leaders. First, to Ruth Spencer, who is the Deputy Chair of the Marine Ecosystems Protected Areas Trust from Esquiwa. 
And then we'll be hearing from the Honorable Patricia Madrigo Cordero. She is the ex vice minister of the environment from the Republic of Costa Rica. And they're going to be talking to us about, um, you know, what we can do. This petition is one, one action we can to support them in their uh, regions, but um, we'd love to hear from you um, about the, the advances of the ratification. Ruth, if you would take us away. Thank you, Ruth. Okay, thank you to Wickham and the other colleagues presenting, some of whom I know who have met at meetings. Thank you for this opportunity to share. And I'm very happy that my country, Antigua and Barbuda, was the first to sign. And the minister did promise he would be the first to ratify, but we didn't make it first. We are number three in the Caribbean. And this was done in March of this year. I am a local practitioner. I'm not a lawyer. But I can make the linkages across sectors in the environment. My capacity building in the ESCASO agreement has come from David and the team at ECLAC. I also want to thank Kate Wilson, the environmental lawyer from St. Lucia. And even though they have not ratified, they have done so much public education and awareness. And she has included me in several of her webinars with the Judiciary Legal Association, so I think St. Lucia is very close to ratifying the wonderful work that they have done. So being a local practitioner, how do I translate the ratification of Eskazu into practical actions? At the local level, I'm working with many groups across different sectors. So in the area of mercury, where we have a lot of toxic and chemical substances, going into a landfill, I support groups who are involved in recycling. We're also involved in plastics, trying to reduce these from going to the landfill. We have a plastic factory coming on stream very shortly. We just got the funding and um, we are trying right now to purchase the equipment to make things with tons and tons of shredded plastic that we have sitting in Antigua in a warehouse. After China stopped purchasing plastics, the factory continued to shred them and we have tons and tons sitting in a warehouse, so we are gonna use it and make products that can be used on island. I've also responded to groups having issues with sanitation. When you have issues with sanitation, it impacts your water, it impacts your soil, it impacts your ear. So local actions are ongoing. So now, as I work with these groups, I have to inform them about the Eskazoo Agreement. The government ratified, but there was very little public education and awareness, as I said. So I'm partnering with the Environmental Awareness Group, uh, NGO in Antigua, and we are going forward with a united voice to bring education and awareness. Antigua is a small, you call them small island states. We are impacted by things like hurricanes and storms. So our environment protection is very important to us because one hurricane and wipe out the GDP of the country in one, just one storm. And so we can't afford to play around with our environmental and ecosystem resources. Those are what protect the island. And the local knowledge that comes from the people is what we have to put into our policy processes. As we look and reflect on what is going on in countries around the world, I don't think we need any more evidence on the significant contribution of the IPLCs, who are the local stewards of the biodiversity. Many of us know about the IPBS assessments, which showed, I think they had 270 mapping sources, but they basically said the lands with biodiversity that is thriving a lands under the stewardship of the, of the indigenous people and local communities. So this is the proof. So why shouldn't we 
protect and defend these people. Why should we not protect them? They are safeguarding our biodiversity. Their, their actions reduce climate change impacts. They reduce land debt issues. So we must, of course, give protection to these people. In my country, we don't have indigenous people, but we have local community people who try to speak out. And when they do speak out, they're put at risk. They're threatened. And so we need this form of protection that guarantees them that their access rights, access to information, access to justice, access to participation is upheld. As I work with the community groups, the information that I provide to them, I have to get it translated. I cannot go with a lot of technical information to them. So the information that's in the big, doc, big technical documents, I have to get them translated. In addition, we are accustomed to hearing, you know, there'll be a consultation in the city at such and such a place. So I now have to say, no, the people live in a particular village, in a particular region of the island, we have to go with them. And you can't just set a date. You have to find out when it's convenient for them, you have to give them advance notice. And these are the kind of changes that we are trying to bring about here in Antigua so that people can share their knowledge and contribute towards the implementation of the Escazo Agreement. The crisis has shown us that our health and the health of the environment is linked. So it's one health. So if you're going to destroy the environment, you're destroying your own health. And what's very important for the Eskazi Agreement in our country is that it includes the vulnerable people, the marginalized people, they who have rights. And these groups must be given a lot of consideration. Eskazi also brings capacity building. It brings technical assistance. And just from the partnerships that I've built over the last few years, even up to now, I see that play out because I can write to partnerships. I can write to people who have met and get knowledge and information. Some of the legal aspects I may not understand, but I try to put it in real terms that will benefit people. Access rights are very, very important because ESCAZU, if you read the other multilateral environmental agreements, they have people at the heart. And the ESCAZU agreement is reflected in a lot of these agreements. So we cannot work in isolation. We have to work where our work hinges on all the other conventions, biodiversity, climate change, land, and mercury. People's lives are impacted when the environmental issues are not considered, when the local knowledge of the people are not built into our policy processes. So I work at the local level, I have connections at the national level, and I also have connections with the Minister of Foreign Affairs who is the focal point for Eskazu? Just today, just this morning, he needed some information. He reached out to me. And I realized that the knowledge, you know, for technicians, for government persons, it's not perfect. So we have to work in partnerships to share information, to build up these knowledge gaps so that we can have a smooth road ahead. And we have made mistakes in the past. We have done things that were wrong. We have destroyed economic ecosystems, but we cannot allow that to happen because the ecosystems, as I said, they cannot be built overnight. You can't ask a company that's building, that's destroying a wetlands to plant at the mangroves. These have been there for generations. So it's no quick fix solution. So my policy going forward, and I've made it very clear, when projects come to the country, let us review them. 
Let's do the due diligence. Let's do the social costs and the benefits. But once you see that the location of them are in protected areas, no, it's an automatic no. We are not going to take no chance with our environmental degradation. So I want to say thank you for the opportunity to share. Thanks for those who have been building our capacity. And as we go forward, we intend to go forward in strength. We're going to educate our people. We're going to bring the awareness. But after that, we have to act. So when we need support to our local groups for their projects, that's going to you know, present hazards and toxic chemicals from feeding into our ecosystems, we expect the donors to support us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ruth, for your powerful words and also really helping us to see not only the need for the ratification, but implementation on the ground and all of that incredible, you know, grassroots work is so important. And we deeply thank you for connecting all of that information for us and what this is going to really take. So thank you for your strength, your wisdom, and your dedication. It's, it's really incredible. Thank you. And now we're going to be hearing from uh, the Honorable Patricia Madrigal Cordero. Again, she's the ex-Vice Minister of environment from the Republic of Costa Rica. Thank you. And I just wanted to say, we're going to keep putting the petition in the chat. We hope that all of you are signing it so we can put this into action. Uh, please uh, take the floor, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Osprey. I'd rather to speak in Spanish so I can give a, a few moments if you want to change for um, Spanish translation. Um, muy buenas tardes y como Good decía, afternoon. As I said, I prefer to speak in Spanish. That is my mother tongue. So I hope that everybody who speaks English that is with us can switch to translation to English. First, I want to thank for organizing this dialogue in a beautiful way because it is very important to create bonds between women who fight for human rights and nature. And if there is a process where it has been important, women leadership, it has been the process of the Escazú Agreement. This has been a process that has been generated for women with a lot of enthusiasm and courage that at some point dreamed about having a legal instrument, a multilateral agreement for Latin American and the Caribbean, and this became a reality. This, we need to remember that the Escazú Agreement it's supported on the principle 10 of the Rio Declaration of 1992 that recognizes that the best way of taking a decision is with the participation of all the stakeholders. And this is what makes the Escazú Agreement while developing the right to participation of people in decision-making processes and environmental information. As Andrea said, in 2012, there was a declaration and it succeeds uh, being finally in agreement with the city of Escazú. So, effectively, as Deadly said, share it with sharing it, we are going to be shaping a collective of people that will unite the human rights issues with the environmental issues. After the adoption of Escazú 2018, it has been a bit difficult to advance, to make progress on some countries. 
because the hurt of the environmental legislation is the access to information. And it also ensures the rights of each people, of, of every person, to a healthy environment. And for the past and the present and the future generations. And this is not only for us that are sharing our life in the earth at this moment, but for the generations that are coming in the future. And it is not only about this environment that we're talking about, but it is about sustainable development. And maybe also about the protection of people so can states can guarantee a secure environment for the environmental defenders. Maybe here is the key of why the countries have taken uh, so many steps and have struggled so much to implement. We've had the opportunity here to listen to such inspiring testimonies that also leave us great challenges and great concerns with regard to how our women leaders are tired. As Ms. Maria Luisa said before, they have not found justice. They have not found a response from the system. And we haven't been able to support them in their efforts. So on the issue of environmental defenders, according to studies that have been carried out, and we can see this clearly, clearly set out in the Global Witness Report of 2019. In the case of women, we are more vulnerable when we become defenders of the environment or environmental causes. And if we add to that, coming from indigenous communities, the vulnerability is even worse. We have heard it in the testimonies this afternoon. where the human rights are not being respected. And so on the issue of environmental defenders, we can be def defenders for our whole life, for a specific cause, for a specific period of time, a specific place, or a national struggle. But in the, end, the Escazú Agreement asks states to guarantee that that can be carried out in a safe way. That's the most important thing that's recognized there. On the issue of human rights defenders, not only should we guarantee that safe and suitable space, but also prevent their criminalization. That call to the judicial systems when justice systems go against those who defend the environment and human rights, not just when there's a persecution or harassment that's going on. Those are the three aspects that are included in the Escasu Agreement. That's why we're not surprised that in some countries, the discussion has become polarized because by polarizing, you divide and you generate false news or false information about what the Escazú Agreement does or doesn't say. And it's harder to move forward in processes of ratification. In Costa Rica, which has taken the leadership from the beginning in 2012 and has had the co-presidency of the Board of Directors, even though it was signed on 
the 27th of September of 2018 at the United Nations. Four or five months went by before the project or the bill was presented in this legislature. And with that number in the file, it was sent to the Commission for International Affairs to go to the judiciary system. What happened there? Well, it was believed there was an omission in the process. And that there should have been a consultation with the full court before it was brought to a constitutional consultation. So that set us back and we went back to a consultation with the full court, all the judges, despite the fact that the legal counsel's report said there was no violation of that article of the political constitution because what the Escazú Agreement establishes is general obligations and it doesn't affect specifically the functioning or the management of judicial power. But the court believed that its functioning was affected and to be approved, they had to be a majority vote of two thirds of the deputies and also the financial resources would have to be established for its for compliance. And then it was sent again to the courts and we were told that the constitutional court believed that despite that consultation, The procedure happened at an inopportune moment and that should go back to initial debates again. And already that debate and unanimous vote had happened already. We went back to February 13th of this year where the Legislative Assembly had to hold a debate had to send it again to a, cons a constitutional consultation, would have to say again, a second debate. So that took months of additional work, not just in the Legislative Assembly and the Judiciary, but also to try to stabilize the sectors that thought that this agreement to be ratified by our country and given status. It's important to think that with the Escazú Agreement entering into force, and I'm sure it's going, sure to, it's be going ratified, to be ratified, that several countries in the Caribbean will soon deposit the ratified instrument, entering into force opens a door that's full of challenges in terms of compliance with it. When the Escazú Agreement comes into force, to make the contents a reality for our individual countries in the region, to respond to these struggles that have been presented this afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm here for any questions you may have. Thank you very much for that powerful presentation, uh, Patricia Cordero and for all the hard work that you've put in and also sharing with us how challenging it is to move through these processes. Um, and as you point out at the end, that even when 
the agreement is ratified, we're all going to need to keep advocating to actually get results on the ground from the agreement and really put it into action and proper implementation. So we are coming to the end of our program. We just have a few moments left. And um, I wanted to bring your attention again, if we could post the um, petition into the chat section where people can continue to sign it. And I also want to put into the chat section, uh, we can um, link to how you can sign on to our newsletter because it's one way that we can all stay connected for all of you who have tuned in because we will continue to put out newsletters around uh, the process that's going on. We will post more about the petition. And then as has been stated by many of the speakers, the implementation is going to need a lot of support from the international community also applying pressure. So this is gonna be an ongoing process, an ongoing campaign in which all of you are invited and you can see why it's so critical. Um, I do see that um, Paloma Costa, who is a youth climate leader for Brazil, I think she just was able to join us. Um, and I'm so sorry we're at the end of our program, so I'm gonna have to ask you just for a really short intervention, but I know you worked really hard to get on, onto this call, and I'm so sorry for any complications you've had earlier today. We're delighted to have you here. So please, if you could maybe give us some inspiring closing comments to send us out, that would be awesome. Thank you. You're on mute, you're on mute. Do you listen to me now? Ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you everyone for the invitation. I'm super sorry I had to be late today. Um, I understand that we also have to give support who carries the world with us. And for me, that's my dog and he needed me today. So I'm super sorry. Um, yes. Um, as Osprey said, my name is Paloma Costa. I am a young climate activist from Brazil. And what I wanted to share with you today, and I will do it really short, is that I was born in a world who made me believe that with all the agreements, we would really make a big step when it comes to protecting the environment and humans' rights. We cannot um, address things as they were separated. We are part of an ecosystem, so we need to have both things in the center of all, all discussions. Unfortunately, this is not the reality we are facing. We still keep exploiting other human beings and our natural resources with no responsibility. And we know that the data, the reports, and all the situations that we face here in Latin America are really happening. We cannot believe in these fake news that are being said by world leaders and in any spaces. And when you think about America Latina, here we really are the outcome of this dominant paradigm of development, which nations still insist that sustain ourselves but are not sustainable at all. And we face this paradigm with our lives. Now in Brazil, as Tylee said, we still may need the ratifying the agreement. But I don't see this advancing here because of, because of setbacks in politics, in the social environmental agenda. And this is super sad for me as a youth advocate and as one of the young leaders that we have here in America Latina. And in my opinion, it's not only about having the sufficient number for the agreement to be implemented here in America Latina. It's about all nations in the LAC region to stand for their responsibility on protecting our public goods, what gives us the presence of life. And still, this, is, this effort is still one step on addressing really the triple emergency that we are facing right now with the climate, with the COVID, with the massive biodiversity loss. And in this um, addressing, we need really full cooperation and a strong coalition for us to win as humanity. Only giving um, for the youth access to justice and access to information is not enough. We need also to address it. it 
systematically. So all countries in Latin America that did not sign it, the ESCASO agreement, they are really bargaining with our lives, with our future. So I'm, I am here to make a stand for all activists, for us to have access to our, our fundamental rights on education, health, environment, in, and to call all countries in Latin America and the Caribbean to sign this CASO agreement. This is not something that we should be discussing anymore. This is like a, a ticket for our future. So I hope here that everyone that is listening and participating with us keep this in mind because we are way behind on guaranteeing the fundamental rights we all need and to protect our environment for, for our existence to be perfect and honest and, and with dignity. So thank you so much for the invitation. I'm super sorry I didn't have the opportunity to contribute more, but I'm super happy to be here and for the pics I see, it was really great. So let's do this together. If we are united, we have a chance to win as humanity. So sign this CASO agreement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paloma Costa. And no need for apologies. We, we know these things happen. We're so glad your voice is here. And maybe all the speakers could put on their videos so everyone can see you as we are signing out from the session today. It would be wonderful to see everyone again. And um, thank you for uh, also reminding us, Paloma, that you know, with the ratification in the 11 countries, it applies to all Latin American and Caribbean. So that's what's so powerful about this, is even if we get to the 11, which we will, it will enforce this rule across the entire region, which gives women and land defenders and the environment power in all of these regions. So let's remember this. this is, quite quite a powerful agreement that could be useful across the entire region and thank you to all of the speakers thank you carmen for your incredible leadership thank you all for working so hard i have such deep respect for all of you who've been in this fight for a very long time and i want to say we will be with you um, as a network uh, many folks um, from around the world have been listening to this conversation it is being recorded and live streamed so we're going to keep building momentum as the international community to support all of you in something that is important to all of us for our lives for mother earth and future generations so with that thank you all for joining us today we really appreciate it thank you and Let's uh, make sure that we win together. We are together. Thank you. Good day to everyone. Thank you.